Hello, I'm Rick Geldhaber, the executive director of the Central City Grand Lyric Opera of the Greater Tri-State Area. When the pandemic hit last year, we were truly devastated to have to cancel our season because we know how much opera means to our community. And then we saw the strife over the summer and realized that we had to do something. Music has the power to cross divides and heal communities, and so we wanted to put our talents to good use. Which is why, for a limited time only, you can stream our award-winning production of Carmen, the story of a brown woman who gets stalked and murdered by a white soldier. It's truly a great work of art. Isn't it? Welcome to the Listener's Guide. I'm Steve. So obviously, if you've read the title of this video, you're expecting a video about Carmen and the sound of race in music. And we're going to get there. But first, I want to talk more broadly about the sorts of stereotypes that Bizet was working with so that you can see how they show up in Carmen. So instead of diving right in, let's talk about an example you may be more familiar with. Disney's 1992 film, Aladdin. Like any good musical, Aladdin opens with a song that establishes the setting and the general mood that the piece is going to have. Since the story is about a poor Arab man whose life is turned around by a magic genie, they need the music to sound mystical and foreign. I'm not going to play the whole song. Musical copyright is a whole other topic we're going to talk about eventually. But we really get all we need out of these first couple seconds. Take a listen. There's a lot happening visually in this little moment. We have smoke wafting up, probably from the magic lamp holding the genie. And if you look closely, the smoke actually does a little hip sway like a belly dancer. So it's not only magic, it's a little sexy even. Sexy magic smoke. You can't make this up. It sounds small, but it's actually pretty important. In establishing this exciting, exotic locale, the animators couldn't resist including a sensual female figure, even if only subtly. The exotic is directly connected to the allure of a woman's body, understood through the male gaze. But this is a music channel, so I really want to home in on how sound contributes to the exoticism in this moment. We hear two different kinds of percussion. One is finger cymbals, an instrument associated with belly dancing. Again, the exotic is directly connected to sexual appeal, this time with imagined bodies doing an imagined sensual dance. The sound really compels the hip sway that we see the smoke do. In other words, it isn't just a visual experience, but also a sound that we recognize as sexual, exotic, and female. But the other percussion we hear kind of complicates things. It's a set of bongos, which come from Afro-Cuban music. So we know the musical team creating Aladdin isn't going so much for a faithful representation of a specific music tradition, but it's more of a grab bag of exotic music building a vaguely non-Western sound world. It's only meant for the American audience to understand as something that's not from around here. And this sound world also has really specific rhythms and melodies. For instance, we hear a really simple long, short, short, long bass line. And we know that this bass line is really important to Disney's vision of the Arabian sound world because when they want to present Aladdin as an Arabian prince, they bring this bass line back to open Prince Ali. So that kind of baseline really undergirds their idea about what this exotic land of Arabia sounds like. And in Arabian Nights, the orchestra follows this sound up with a sort of snake charmer melody that sounds like this. And this, well, this is a real old school stereotypical sound that is used so often it has its own name the double harmonic major scale, also called. So we're not going to call it that since the G word is a slur, but like, you get it. The double harmonic major scale is a pretty common calling card for 
the East. You hear it a lot in reference to things like belly dancing, snake charmers, barbaric warriors, you know, all that good stuff. It's composed of a major scale with the second and sixth scale degrees lowered by a half step. So if you go up the C major scale, we can give every key a number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we're back at one when we reach C on top. For the double harmonic major scale, we take notes number two and six, and instead of playing the white key, we play the black key to their left. One lowered two, then a normal three, four, five, lowered six, normal seven, and one. That makes an unusual jump here and here. These kinds of leaps are not very common in European melodies of the last couple hundred years, or more accurately, not in white Christian European melodies. It is common in Roma and Jewish communities, which is why you'll hear it all over the place in, say, Fiddler on the Roof. And it was this association with Jewish and Roma music, originally called the Stil Hongroise, or Hungarian style, that likely led it to take on a sort of generalized sound of the other with a capital O, encapsulating basically everybody who is supposed to be unlike us with a capital U. Probably the most famous melody to use it comes from Samson and Delilah by Camille Sassons, an opera that came out in France around the same time as Carmen. It's the story of a handsome and honorable soldier who is taken from the Lord's path by an exotic and sexy woman, ultimately leading to both of their destruction, which, like, it's just the plot of Carmen. These people only had, like, three ideas for what operas to write. Dipper gets it. In the final act of Samson and Delilah, Sassons threw in a ballet to set the scene of the Philistine temple where Samson was to be a human sacrifice to their god. And what's going on in the temple? Well, a bunch of brown characters are swaying their hips to a tune in double harmonic major. Oh, the Met. Never a surprise, always a disappointment. But again, we have this potpourri of exotic percussion in Samson and Delilah, including tambourines, castanets, and a mishmash of drums playing this long, short, short, long rhythm. You'll notice we don't actually know what Philistine music sounds like or what they got up to in their temples. We just know that this music is code for the sinful brown people we're supposed to hate. And this is one of the important arguments that Edward Said puts forward in his book Orientalism. He says, we need not look for correspondence between the language used to depict the Orient and the Orient itself. Not so much because the language is inaccurate, but because it's not even trying to be accurate. What it is trying to do is at one and the same time characterize the Orient as alien and to incorporate it schematically on a theatrical stage whose audience, manager, and actors are for Europe, and only for Europe. The Bacchanal wasn't actually supposed to teach us anything about ancient religions and what is now Israel and Palestine. It was just supposed to show us by contrast how civilized the European audience was. And Aladdin, in the same way, wasn't really trying to celebrate multicultural experiences of music to get Middle Eastern audiences to say, oh look, it me. Instead, they wanted to make the presumed white American audience say, oh look. It them. The performance, to paraphrase Said, is by white Americans and for white Americans. But most importantly for us, it comes with a specific set of sounds that let the audience know we're talking about exotic, far-off characters. And once you learn to recognize these sounds, you'll hear them all over the place, from television, to film, to Broadway, to ballet, and any of those would be a fruitful discussion. But today we're talking about Carmen. <laughs> Thank you. 
So when discussing a recent royal opera production of Carmen he was in, Luca Pisaroni had this to say. If you think how revolutionary this opera must have been when people saw it for the first time, a woman that says, don't care about society, and I have the same right as a man. Pisaroni was trying to present Carmen as some sort of progressive, groundbreaking work, telling women to take control of their destinies. And he's not the first person to say this. Plenty of opera companies market the show as a feminist masterpiece. And I think this just goes to show how wildly unprepared the opera industry is to deal with issues of gender and race in any substantial way. I mean, look at this ad by Opera Carolina. They're totally unafraid to use a racial slur to describe Carmen they blame her behavior, which they describe in really stereotypical terms, for her being stalked and murdered, downplay Don Jose's involvement in her murder, and then somehow say that this makes her a feminist heroine for the ages. It shows a surface-level understanding of both feminism and the action of the opera. Feminism is more than just women doing what they want, and Carmen is certainly not the heroine. In reality, Carmen's individuality and exercising free will makes her the villain designed to warn good white people about the dangers of brown women. Carmen is a Romani woman in Seville who is very freely sexual. When she's worried about her future, she doesn't pray like a good Christian, but instead reads her fortune in playing cards. This ticks off all the Orientalist boxes. She's brown. She's non-Christian. She's promiscuous. So what's the very first music that the opera uses to describe her? That's right, she gets the double harmonic major snake charmer music from earlier, and I'm not usually one to make Freudian arguments, but come on, these jokes write themselves. So before the opera's even begun, we know what to expect. Brown ladies swinging their hips, just like Aladdin and Samson and Delilah. 20 minutes later, when Carmen first appears on stage, Bizet drives the point home. Men ogle at other cigarette ladies and say, we don't see Carmen, and then... <laughs> They just, they throw in the scary brown lady music in double time to make her sound even more chaotic. But after this point, Bizet actually did get a little more inventive. Carmen is one of the first operas to get a little more specific about what kind of brown the dangerous sexy lady was. Carmen was not just exotic, she was a Spanish Romani woman. And when she enters, she gets a Spanish style entrance aria. An entrance aria is the first song that a character sings on stage. They like tell you who they are and what their personality traits is like and what impact they're going to have on the story. Like in The Barber of Seville, Figaro tells you that he's a barber who really likes helping people. Figaro, 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 Figaro. I know it's dumb, but a lot of operas don't have the time for character development on account of how long it takes to sing stuff. Carmen's entrance aria is one of the most famous ever. The Avanella. The text is pretty much what you would expect. She's a sexy brown, sorry, bohemian lady who is a threat to any man who loves her. You've probably heard it, but just in case, here's some of verse one. But what I really want to focus on today is the refrain, which sounds like this. And obviously there's a lot to unpack here. What's clear though is that she's not bound by the social expectation to be a docile, submissive woman specifically because she's not one of us. She's Roma, one of them with the capital T, and that makes her free to do as she pleases. 
But that freedom also makes her a threat to the Order of Seville. I mean, she's literally singing this to a brigade of soldiers tasked with keeping the peace. And over the course of the opera, she makes it clear that they've got their work cut out for them. She gets in fights, she hangs around seedy hotels, and she smuggles contraband. Not exactly the things that 19th century Parisians thought made their society better. And this is why I have such a problem with people saying Carmen is a revolutionary strong woman. The opera presents a strong woman as a problem to be fixed, not as some sort of feminist role model. And the habanera makes that clear from the get-go. But again, we're here to talk specifically about the music. You may have noticed that this song doesn't have some of the more obvious signs of Orientalism. We don't have the snake charmer music from earlier, for one. But this music is still clearly trying to transport you to an exotic location, specifically Seville, by way of an exotic music genre, the habanera. It was a popular music genre in French salons that came up from Spain, and it had all the marks of exoticism. Middle class people would sing habaneras at the piano as a way to play dress up as Spanish, because Spain was always kind of in this middle ground between Western Europe and the Orient, specifically because of its many economic connections to North African and Middle Eastern countries. And don't get me wrong, habaneras were also exoticist in the Spanish context. The genre is named after the Cuban capital, Havana, because it was a way for Spanish people to play dress up as these goofy, uncivilized locals in the American colonies. Like, this exoticism is turtles all the way down. And this xenophobia is really encapsulated by the origin story of the song itself. We know Bizet didn't really bother to venture that far outside the salons of Paris to research this song because, well, <laughs> it's plagiarized and not even like secretly or anything. This is just a straight up copy of a song by the Spanish composer Sebastian Iradier. Bizet heard Iradier's habanera, and his head was so far up his own butt that he just assumed it was a folk song as old as time instead of taking two seconds to figure out who might have written it. They didn't have Google back then or anything, but like, come on, the pianist would have had sheet music. And in case you still don't believe me, here's Bizet. <laughs> here's Iradier. Andy Radier. This wasn't like a mistake or an unexpected coincidence. This was copying. But it really represents the xenophobia at the core of the opera Carmen. Bizet couldn't be bothered to do real research on Spanish music or the music of Romani musicians in Seville. Just like the Orientalist composers before and around him, Bizet only wanted to write something that marked Carmen as the other. And Habanera was good enough for him. She's still a dangerous, sexy brown lady, and even though Bizet made a half-hearted effort to add Spanish to the mix, the other adjectives are ultimately the more important ones. And all the famous scenes of the opera have some element of this. Carmen invites Don Jose to an inn for some drunken debauchery, and what does she do? She gets a lap dance with castanets, and then her friends come to collect her for some help with their crimes, and they use black magic to read her future. Also, this random bullfighter shows up to sing about how awesome he is, and the whole point of the Toreador is to be the Chad that Carmen leaves Jose for. And come on, we all know that bullfighters are just walking metaphors for boners. I've read Hemingway. Like, everything we celebrate about this opera is steeped in old school Orientalism. Everything we like is about Carmen's dangerousness, sexiness, and brownness, and how those things cause problems for everyone else. And at this point, I know that you might be raising objections. Well, you can't blame it on Bizet. The 19th century was super racist, and there's nothing we can do about that now. And like, that's true to a certain extent. I mean, 
There's probably something he could have done, but my beef isn't really with Bizet at all. He's long gone. When a show ends up on stage, though, it's because a lot of people decided to do it. At the end of the day, Bizet only wrote a score, and the score is only a set of instructions. Bizet's instructions happen to have a lot of racism, though, and people just do it. Like, when the racism shows up on stage, it's because we did it. We did the racism, and that's where my beef is. We're still doing the racism, and not enough people seem to recognize it for what it is. And I mean that sincerely. I think a lot of opera fans, performers, conductors, and creative teams haven't really taken the time to think about what this opera says about race, and I'm trying really hard not to be too accusatory in this video because I genuinely think it's a blind spot, even if it's one that I think should be way more obvious than it apparently is. So, why do we keep doing this? <laughs> In my experience working with opera companies, the main reason anyone ever does Carmen is because it makes money, just like Nutcracker for ballet companies, and don't worry Piotr, we'll get to you someday. Every opera company stages at least one or two shows that are guaranteed to fill seats so that they're not hemorrhaging money. So on the one hand, we keep putting it on because <sighs> the free market demands it. But a part of me also thinks this is a bit of a cop-out. Opera companies don't actually work on the free market per se, or at least they don't rely mainly on ticket sales for their income. I looked through the financial statements of seven American opera companies and found that the typical one can only expect about 21% or so of their income to come from ticket sales. A much bigger portion, about 51%, comes from individual and corporate donors. The remainder is usually filled with government grants, endowments, and services like rentals on the equipment and space. So actually the most important market for an opera company is the donor class. Much more of their revenue is made by pleasing wealthy contributors than by pleasing general audiences. And this creates a sort of tastemaker role for donors. They exert a ton of influence on what gets performed, regardless of audience appeal. But the thing about donors establishing taste is that they don't have a broad repertoire that they know. You don't exactly get to be a rich millionaire philanthropist by studying classical music all day. I mean, do I look rich to you? <laughs> so donors know what they've heard for most of their lives, and that's basically it. And that means we fall into a routine. We know what pieces people liked in the past, and we let that determine what we do in the future. Instead of letting the proverbial cream rise to the top then, we kind of just started going, ah, I'll have the usual. This isn't the story of great music being great, but rather good enough music being good enough. And the problem with that is that we've let the situation go on for long enough that we're performing a bunch of stage works from one or two hundred years ago at best. And when we do that, we have to understand that we're also putting on shows that reflect societal attitudes of one or two hundred years ago. Just to give you some perspective, Carmen premiered in America just after the end of Reconstruction, which, you know, wasn't exactly the height of racial tolerance in our history. Eugenics was a few years from taking off, but there was still scientific consensus in Europe that biological differences between races created a hierarchy with white people at the top. And whether or not Bizet was actually trying to win hearts and minds to that cause, a production like Carmen is still a symptom of that kind of thought process seeping into the culture. But performing Carmen in the 21st century perpetuates this kind of racist mindset long past the point we were supposed to let it go, and it has real-world consequences. If you look through newspapers and various social justice-oriented websites, you can see that Romani people still deal with the effects of these stereotypes to this day. Whether it's sexual assault, forced evictions, discrimination in the workplace, or, you know, the Holocaust. A show like Carmen isn't actually just a harmless stereotype. It says a lot about how we feel about the people in our communities. And we, of course, refers largely to the white people who are still in charge of most of the opera industry nowadays. It's generally white people deciding that we need to perform Carmen, deciding how we perform Carmen, and even doing the performing itself. 
So when these racialized portrayals come up, I think it's important to be 100% clear that this is about how white people see other races. This is actually where I get kind of worked up whenever I think about operas like Carmen. It's really personal for me because opera is such a huge part of how I became who I am today, and I really care about the art form as a whole, but I've gotten so disillusioned as I've pulled myself out of the really sheltered world of what I can only call music worship. It's this idea that's drilled into you from the second you start studying classes classical music, that there's something deep and spiritual about it. We've repeated to ourselves over and over again that it's deep and that you just have to look past the surface, and that started to feel less like a reason to really get to understand the music than an excuse to shut off any engagement. I mean, I've been in grad school for what, like, six years now, and the deeper I engage with music, the more I really dig into and interact with the sounds I hear, the more I recognize stuff like this. And I hope I've demonstrated that it's not just some tangles of yarn on a bulletin board leading to a wild conspiracy theory. It's clear stuff that is broadly accepted in the academic music world, but that you can also see in similar patterns in your daily life. And when someone tells me not to worry about it, that Carmen is feminist actually, and that it's deep, and that you just don't get it, it starts to sound like what they're asking of me is to turn off the part of my brain that cares about stuff. The part that, like, notices things that I see and puts them in the context of other things that I've seen and sees that that's kind of racist and recognizes that racism is bad and then thinks like, hey, let's not do that. But like, if we want the art form to survive, we have to be able to stand behind the productions we're trying to convince people to watch. And that means presenting something with a message we believe in. It also means only working with people who support that value system because there are too many people out there in the world who act a lot like Don Jose, but that's a whole other can of worms that I don't really want to open when I'm already 4,000 words into this video. But you feel me, right? And I also recognize that this is scary. Admitting the racism in Carmen and its harmful effects feels a little bit like it'll turn into that scene in Ratatouille where that old lady shoots at a single mouse, the mouse being the opera Carmen, I guess, and the whole colony falls from the ceiling. Like, literally every time I have this conversation with someone, the question comes up, well, if Carmen's racist, what about Madame Butterfly? What about the Mikado? What about Sanson and Delilah, Nabucco, Akhenaten, the abduction from the Seraglio, that one scene in La Traviata, the Italian in Algiers, Aida, Turandot, the Pearl Fishers, that one scene in The Ghosts of Versailles, Lachme, Zalame, Electra, Otello, Attila, the Golden Cockerel, Iolanta, Nixon in China. And uh, uh, yeah, it's a big problem. Racism is a big part of the operas that we love, and it's long past time that we take an industry-level look at it. But again, this video is about Carmen, which I think can provide at least, like, a starting point. So what can we do with this one? <laughs> So if I'm being perfectly honest, my hottest take is that my life wouldn't personally be any different if nobody ever performed Carmen again. There's nothing specifically Carmen does for me that I need to see it in person. And if I ever need to watch it, like hypothetically, if I were researching it for a video, there are so many recordings to choose from that it doesn't really need to be done live. Carmen is not at particular risk of fading into obscurity if staging stopped altogether. Plus, like, I guess if I'm on a roll with hot takes here, it's not particularly good. Like, I hate everyone in the story. It's a light opera based on what was essentially 19th century pulp fiction, but the opera found surprise success, and now we treat it like it's manna from the gods. It's basically James Bond the opera, except James Bond is naive and useless, and loses to the Russian spy lady. I don't need that in my life. The biggest draw is the so-called Spanish flair, and like, I can get that from Spanish and Latin American composers? Like, stage a Zarzuela, stage a Latin American opera. There are so many options. But I do recognize that other people actually care about Carmen and will stage it. And here are a few thoughts. 
Starting with the boldest, you've got to rewrite a lot of it. The biggest problem with Carmen is that she's presented as a two-dimensional, racially stereotyped villain, and Don Jose is some sort of anti-hero figure, but like, Don Jose stalks and murders her, and that's bad. So I would want to see a production present Don Jose as the villain and Carmen as the tragic heroine. I'd need the artistic team to add scenes where we learn more about Carmen. Stuff like her family life, her work life, her experience of these racialized and gendered interactions with the white men and women of Seville. It should be easy to add the dialogue since a lot of the dialogue in Carmen is spoken instead of sung. And that means you can add songs pretty easily too. Just just pull songs from other operas or even write some new ones. Support living composers. And frame the new songs with dialogue so you don't have to put in too many scenes between this new stuff and what Bizet wrote. Obviously, this will make the opera longer, so you probably have to cut some scenes. And I might recommend by cutting the most egregiously racist scenes, but those scenes, as I said, are the most famous. So uh... if you insist on doing Carmen, and you insist on doing the scenes most bound up in this racist tradition, then you have to make it clear that those scenes, both the way they play out dramatically and the way that they sound, are racist caricatures and that those racist caricatures are harmful. When Carmen essentially does a lap dance for Don Jose with a tambourine, the scene itself plays into the fetishization of women of color, and the director has to stick out their neck to say, this is bad. You need to unsettle the action by questioning whether Carmen is actually performing for Don Jose, or if this is just a fantasy in his head. I'm reminded of how the film version of the musical Chicago presents all the songs on a stage and juxtaposes that with real-time action that contradicts the song. Mama Morton sings about how she's always going to care for the women in her charge, but in reality, she doesn't care at all. Billy Flynn sings about how he only needs love, but in real life he's obsessed with luxuries like custom suits and private cars. With Carmen, you can do something like that to show that her dance is not real, and that in reality, Don Jose is a sexual predator who happened to fixate on Carmen, and very little of what actually happened is her fault. I do have more specific ideas, but like, if you want them, you're gonna have to pay me consulting fees. And I'm gonna be real. No matter how creative you are in your solution, it's probably gonna be a hard sell. Nobody likes it when you say, don't portray racial stereotypes, while you yourself are currently portraying a racial stereotype. And on top of that, no matter what you do with costuming and staging, the music and the text are still engaged in those exotic stereotypes. There are sounds that still don't change when you stage things a little differently, and sound needs just as much attention as any other element. It can also feel like you really wanted to do the stereotype the whole time, and you feel like throwing out a hashtag woke buzzword or two will absolve you of actually having to take responsibility for it. And also from an audience perspective, I genuinely don't think enough people care. We've developed a culture in the 20th century of letting directors and conductors guide popular tastes so that a lot of audiences need that leadership to say very clearly what is and is not acceptable. But directors and conductors also seem to be the most invested in music leadership, so we probably also need opera administrators to seek out people who are willing to put in the work necessary to challenge this exact culture. And it just ends up that there's so much institutional inertia and it always seems to be somebody else's fault. So there's no denying that Carmen as an opera is rooted in 19th century racism against brown people and that it's too often being presented by people who don't know about or aren't willing to address that racism. And the problem seeps into so many other operas that we present. And I worry that our unwillingness to change our approach to better reflect our current values will continue to push opera down the path it's currently on. In not responding to or reflecting society, it'll become more and more marginal as an art form. And I know everybody has always said that classical music is dying, and I really don't believe it is. But it's certainly not growing the way that it could if we made more of an effort to abide by the values that we claim to have. So, hi! Thanks for watching! I've been working on this script for like...
two years, I think. And um, I'm glad that it's finally happening. I hope that it's broken the log jam and uh, I'll be making more videos. I do have some more ideas, but like every time I say that, uh, it, it doesn't exactly happen, if you haven't noticed. So um, let's just all cross our fingers that good things come of this. Uh, like, share, and subscribe. Leave some comments. Uh, and hopefully this is, I don't know, good things are coming. That's right, she gets, <clears throat> that's right, she gets the, that's right, she, that's right, she gets the double hard learn, why can't I say this line? <laughs> How's that? I feel like I'm turning into an <laughs> <laughs> Think. No. <laughs>